Welcome to Understanding Islam, the big picture. This week we ask the question, what is the Quran? Can I remind you first of all that next week we have our question and answer session. So if you would like to email in a question, you would be very welcome. Also, you can find more information about today's topic on an article that you can download from my website. So let us ask the question, what is the Quran? Well, the name Quran itself means the recitation. So it is the last scripture which was given to Muhammad, which he was to recite, to convey, to transmit to the world we need to go back to a particular moment in history, to the year 610, to the month of Ramadan, which was the name of a month in the Arab calendar, and to a dark night toward the end of that month. Muhammad, as was his custom, was spending some time alone in a cave on Mount Hira, it was a very dark night, and during the darkness of this night, a bright light appeared on the distant horizon. It drew closer until it could be identified, and then it was identified as the angel Jibril, Gabriel in the Arabic form. Jibril drew closer and then said to Muhammad, Ikra, Ikra comes from the word to recite, but it is the command form. Speak forth, tell me. Muhammad doesn't know what to say, and so the angel comes closer and again says, Ikra. This time Muhammad responds saying, I am Umi. Umi is a word which means both without school learning, without having been schooled in the earlier writings, especially in the earlier scriptures. The meaning of this is very important. I do not know what it is you want me to say. Whatever you want me to say has to be given to me by God. Jibril then draws closer and takes Muhammad in an embrace. This is a heart-to-heart -heart embrace, and the heart is understood as being the seat of knowledge and wisdom. In the process of this embrace, the heart of Muhammad is purified by the sending down of the Quran upon his heart. Jibril then steps back and again says, Ikra. This time, the first verses of the Quran well up from the heart of Muhammad. They are there within him. It's not that he has to memorize them or that he is hearing them through his ear. They are, as the Quran says of itself, sent down upon his heart. And you can find them in the Quran in chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. So from this you can learn the first lesson about the Quran. It is not a book arranged in chronological order. Now it is very important to get this process of revelation clear in our heads. Because Muhammad is in no sense the author of the Quran. He is the recipient, the conveyor, the transmitter of the message that is given to him. Authorship lies with God. It's also important to remember that the Quran is sent down upon the heart of Muhammad. It is not something he has to learn. It is not something that he picks up and reads. The process of it coming from his heart to his lips. This is a process the Quran tells us is under the direction of the trusted spirit. 
another name for the angel Gabriel. This means that God is in control of the process from the sending down of the Quran upon the heart of Muhammad right up to the moment that it is robed in Arabic language and emerges from his lips. The words which we use for revelation in Arabic, wahi, tanzil, literally mean to send down. It was sent down from the heavenly realm of God to the heart of Muhammad, and it was then brought forth from his lips in Arabic, the whole process being under divine control. This is a monumental day in the history of the world, because this is understood by Muslims to be the last revelation, the revelation which is universal and for all time and for all peoples. So this night is commemorated every year in what is called Laylat al-Qadr, the night of power or the night of destiny. And Muslims will seek to be found awake on this night by God, praying and waiting to hear any direction or guidance which is sent to them by God on that night. The process of sending down the word of God to the heart of Muhammad under divine control is the way in which God revealed scripture to all the prophets who have ever received it. And so Tanzil is understood as the divine process of sending down the Kalam Allah, the speech or word of God, to the human prophet in the human language that that prophet speaks. What we can say about the sending down of the Quran to the heart of Muhammad is a parallel process to what we can say about the sending down of the Torah to Moses or the Injil to Jesus. The verses of the Quran emerge from the lips of Muhammad in small portions over the next 22 years until his death. Our question then is, how are they recorded? There are two deposits for recording the Quran from the lips of Muhammad. The first is in the heart of the memorizers. Now remember, first of all, that the memorizers of whom we speak are men and women who lived by memorization. They memorized long poems. They memorized their genealogies. They memorized the traditions and the folklore of their people. This was not a generation of people who wrote things down. And so it was men and women like this who memorized the Quran. They cross-checked each other. The Prophet cross-checked them. And indeed, we have some occasions recorded during this 22-year period when the angel Jibreel came to the Prophet and he recited all the verses of the Quran that had been revealed up until that time. As the verses were revealed, he was told by God into which chapter they were to be placed. In Arabic, for chapter, we say surah. So there are 114 surahs in the Quran. They are of very different lengths. The shortest is only three verses. The longest is 286 verses. And so knowing when a surah or a set of verses was revealed becomes a very important part in understanding their meaning. This is the first deposit of the revelation of the Quran and over the period of these 22 years, the memorizers memorized everything and held it within their hearts. 
The second deposit was a written deposit. There were some people in the early Muslim community who could write, and so, quite naturally, they wrote down whatever they could remember from the Quran on pieces of stone, on pieces of bone or parchment or leaves, bark, wood, anything that they could find on which to write. Now, some of them were obviously more advanced in their writing skills than others. So we are to understand that we have a collection of verses here in the hands of a variety of people. A few people appear to have had complete collections. The vast majority of people just have some verses. The Prophet realizes what is going on and so appoints two official scribes. We have their names, Zayd ibn Tabat and his own cousin Ali. Their job is to make sure that everything is taken down in due order and preserved in writing from the lips of Muhammad. This means that by the time that the Prophet dies and the revelation ends, we have two deposits of the Quran. One in the written form by the scribes and others, and one in the hearts of the memorizers. The oldest copies that we have of the Quran today are manuscript copies dating from probably the last quarter of the 8th century. And they are in the libraries of Istanbul, of Mashhad, of Sana'a, and of Tashkent. God knew that the earlier scriptures that had been sent to the earth, which had been left with the communities of those prophets, had not been properly preserved. And God didn't want that to happen again with the Quran. And so this time, God declares in the Quran that God will ensure the preservation of this text without change or alteration for all eternity. And therefore, the Quran is the principal miracle of Islam. It is preserved for all peoples and for all times. The Quran is revealed in Arabic. It was the language of Muhammad. It was the language of his people. Therefore, if one wants to understand the Quran, one has to understand it with the knowledge of the way that Arabic was spoken by those people at that time, and in particular looking at any short pieces of poetry and such like that exist from before the time of the Quran. But the Quran is regarded as being the principal deposit of literature in the Arabic language. It, in a sense, forms the, Ar the Arabic language into a single grammatic unity. Now, like any other piece of literature in a particular language, if you translate it into another language, you lose a great deal of its meaning. Any translation is an interpretation. Therefore, the Quran is only really the Quran when it is in Arabic. Although it has, of course, been translated into all the principal languages of the earth, and there are more than 20 English translations of the Quran available today. If you want to understand the message of the Quran, then you have to treat it seriously within its context. First of all, the Quran hardly ever says everything in just one place. And so you have to look for all the verses in the Quran that were revealed about a particular topic. The Quran is revealed over a period of 22 years, and therefore we need to know at what time were these verses revealed? What was going on in the life of the Muslim community? If you like, what was the question that society was asking 
to which these verses of the Quran is the answer. If you don't know what the question is, then you cannot understand the answer. And so each of the revelations of the Quran about a particular topic must be taken against the immediate context of their revelation. We call this the occasions of revelation. One then has to combine all this teaching together and to review it against the overall teaching of the Quran itself because the Quran is consistent in its teaching. These occasions of revelation are contained in the hadith, in the biographies of the Prophet, in the early histories, and in the early commentaries upon the Quran. In the Shia tradition, the Imams also are able to give infallible interpretation of the meaning of the verses of the Quran and therefore their interpretation is privileged over that of anyone else. Now once this process of interpreting the Quran has been worked through, one has to lift from it the golden message of the teaching of the Quran. And it is that golden message which is then to be applied to new societies as they come in contact with the Quranic message. If we want to come to some understanding of the Quran, then it's important to see it not as a book or even as a scripture, but as the word of God sent down through Muhammad to all humankind. Therefore, to memorize the Quran is to have the word of God living in one's heart. To recite the Quran is to have the word of God tripping over one's tongue. To write it beautifully with calligraphy is to beautify the word of God. From the very earliest times, the times of Muhammad himself, there have been those men and women who have memorized the whole of the Quran. They are given the title Hafiz for a man or Hafiza for a woman. These are those in whose hearts the whole of the Quran lives. Now, they have taken it upon themselves down through the generations to teach the memorized version of the Quran to the next generation. And so it is possible sometimes to trace back one person learnt it from another, learnt it from another, so that they become a chain of transmitters of the memorized text of the Quran. We know that slaves were taken from West Africa to the Americas. They went with nothing, but they carried the Quran memorized in their hearts. And so we know that when things had settled down, it was possible for others who could write to make a written copy of the Quran by, as we would say, downloading the memorizers. This is particularly important when we consider that only about 15% of Muslims worldwide have Arabic as their mother tongue. That means 85% don't. Now, if we add a generous 10% to that total, for those who have mastered the Arabic language, that still means that three quarters of the Muslims in the world do not command the Arabic language. And so when they memorize the Quran, they do so phonetically. When they recite it, they do so phonetically. This reminds us that the Quran is more than just a text and a body of knowledge. It brings the believer into a relationship with God. We can think, for example, how many people like to go to Italian opera. But do you understand Italian? No, I don't. But it's a spiritual experience just to be in the presence of that beautiful music.
Because of the respect that Muslims show to copies of the Quran, they will always be treated with great dignity and honor. You will often find a copy of the Quran wrapped in a beautiful cloth or put into a, a box so that it can be protected from uh, any moisture or from dust. A Muslim will perform a ritual washing before handling a copy of the Quran because it is the word of God. The Quran speaks to the heart of the Muslim and therefore brings the Muslim into that relationship with God. And calligraphy, the art of beautiful writing for verses of the Quran, is sometimes called the prayer of the heart in visual form. Join me next week when we'll ask the question, what is the purpose of religion?